Hello and welcome back to Picks and Portraits. Walt Disney was a visionary. Obviously, he launched a monolithic media empire, his work has brought joy to millions of people, and he created worlds, both animated and real. He was also a futurist, who dedicated his final years to planning and developing the Society of Tomorrow. Now we talked about his role in the 1964 World's Fair in Episode 1, but his contributions or visions of tomorrow started long before then. In this video, we are going to be looking at the predictions Disney and his namesake company made and the influence they've had on our present, uh, this future. The earliest example I could find was a 1927 Oswald short, The Mechanical Cow. In it, Oswald has a robot cow he can ride uh, and somehow milk to feed and sustain children. Uh, it's very bizarre, uh, but in a weird way, I feel it can be read as possibly forecasting synthetic food. Uh, there is also 1933's Mickey's Mechanical Man. Uh, this short featured Mickey training a mechanical man, or robot, for a boxing match. It would face a rabid gorilla, Congo killer, in what was being dubbed the Battle of the Century, technology versus nature, uh, certainly relevant to the 20th century. No further context is given, uh, but it does respond to horns, which many exploits, leading to its victory. 1937 saw the release of Modern Inventions. This featured Donald Duck paying visit to the Museum of Modern Marvels. Uh, he is greeted by a robot butler, which leads to the recurring gag of this butler taking his hat, no matter how many times he changes it. Uh, the museum's exhibits consist of absurd innovations, like a robot that hitchhikes for you, uh, R.I.P. Hitchbot. There is also an automatic gift wrapper, uh, which I feel like has come true, a robo-nanny that attempts to soothe an upset child, and a shoeshine slash barber. Uh, this was a popular futuristic gag at the time. Uh, we would see it again in a couple years with the Fleischer's Olds Fair at the fair. Uh, this was David Max Fleischer's contribution to the 1939 World's Fair, uh, which informed so many of the aesthetics associated with retrofuturism. Uh, Disney himself actually produced a short that screened at the fair titled Mickey's Surprise Party. Uh, now this is not futuristic in the least. It finds Minnie trying to cook Mickey cookies uh, like his mom used to make. She fails, but Nabisco saves the day. This is a notable cartoon for a few reasons. Uh, it is one of the few Disney productions in the public domain. It also featured product placement, which Disney had been against for many years. Uh, if I was to guess, I would say he gave in because profits were suffering uh, due to the war in Europe. Uh, there didn't seem to be much of a future between the late 30s and mid 40s uh, because of this war. During this time, Disney lent his studio to the effort. Uh, more on that in animation propaganda. We cover that period, as well as the Disney strike and his testifying in front of HUAC there. Uh, so check it out if you haven't. The 1950s brought with them peace. For the uh, first time in decades, seemingly there was a tomorrow that wasn't terrible. Uh, for some, many were still struggling, uh, still are. But without the burden of war, the possibilities seemed endless. This was, after all, the space age when humanity looked up to the stars and beyond. This was also the decade Disney gave us the immersive experience Disneyland, which brought together not only his properties, but also America's past and his vision of the future. When Disneyland first opened in 1955, its futuristic-themed world Tomorrowland intended to showcase the future of 1986. Early exhibits included Autopia, which allowed riders to experience the highway, then the future of interstate travel, as well as the TWA Moonliner. This was a 73-foot-tall rocket sponsored by Howard Hughes Transworld Airlines that intended to serve as a blueprint for commercial travel to the moon. Tomorrowland would be introduced to millions through Walt Disney's television program, also called Disneyland, uh, later known as the Wonderful World of Disney. This was Disney's venture into the budding medium of television. It was an anthology series that would not only explore the different worlds of Disneyland, but also topics related to them. Uh, relevant to our subject is Ward Kimball's Man in Space, an episode which aired in 1955. In this, the leading minds of space travel explain how rockets work, and what space travel may look like to Disney animators, and their interpretations or renditions of this information. It's fascinating. These are animated in a mid-century modern style and were directed by Kimball, who also presents the special. Uh, being produced in 1955, the technology to get rockets into space is available, uh, but the effects that this would have on people were still unknown uh, or unconfirmed. We see the history of rocket propulsion in both cartoon form and archival footage, which is incredible. It also looks at the training astronauts must endure to make it in space, uh, in theory, as well as space medicine, what will be available to these astronauts to combat space madness. Uh, or the possible existential crisis associated with going where no one has gone before. The episode ends with an animated projection of what the first manned space mission may look like. It's done in a less cartoony style, uh, kind of reminds me of constructivism uh, or old Soviet propaganda posters. Uh, the spacecraft resembles an airplane. It has a windshield and viewing window for the navigator, and the mission is presented as easy and relatively pain-free. 1957 saw the opening of another Disney projection of Where We May Live Tomorrow, the Monsanto House of the Future. Think of it as an open house to tomorrow. We see an ultrasonic dishwasher, a fridge specifically for radiated food, 
uh, microwave, and climate control system. It also predicts handless phone calls and small television screens scattered throughout the house. Uh, Monsanto would become famous for something other than this vision of tomorrow, but they would also later sponsor adventure through inner space, a trip that shrunk writers and took them through the molecular structure of a snowflake. For somebody who was very protective of his properties, there were a lot of corporate sponsorships at Disneyland early on. Uh, I guess this was the only way these exhibits could be made. Or maybe Disney was predicting corporatocracy, I'm not sure, but many celebrated the materials of the future, like aluminum and plastic, and were brought to us by companies that have done their fair share of polluting our future, uh, like Monsanto. At, uh, at least that's how I'll remember it. By the 1960s, the original Tomorrowland was already becoming obsolete. As its philosophy was to constantly progress, a new Tomorrowland was designed, incorporating some of the exhibits from the 1964 New York World's Fair following its closure. General Electric's Carousel of Progress landed in Tomorrowland, as did a modified version of the Ford Magic Skyway, rebranded the People Mover, uh, which has a grisly history and no longer exists in this form, but this is what Disney saw as the future of commuting. It took visitors all around Tomorrowland, but Disney himself envisioned it could connect communities, replacing traditional public transit. The success of these exhibitions uh, in New York had also proved there was interest in something like Disneyland on the East Coast. Now this was somebody who had conquered the realms of art and entertainment, he had built a shrine to his and his country's experience, and so the next logical step was for him to build his own city. Disney purchased nearly 200,000 acres in Florida, intending to build a fully functional, futuristic city, Epcot, or the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Epcot was envisioned as part of a larger community, known as Disney World, that included a theme park as well as its own airport. Disney had also lobbied and won jurisdiction over this land, giving him complete control of his vision. The film we're seeing was produced to sway major American corporations to invest or get on board. Walt had hoped these companies would set up shop in Epcot and would encourage them to use its community to test out new innovations. With Epcot, Disney set out to solve the issues of modern cities. His was to be multi-layered, with pedestrians and automobiles given their own thoroughfares. Residents would travel locally uh, by people mover and over longer distances to the theme park or airport via monorail. Cars were permitted but were deemed unnecessary and supplies would be brought in through underground tunnels as to not break the illusion. Uh, visitors would be encouraged. There was to be a hotel and convention center in the middle of the city, but the goal was to have permanent residence. It's a little weird how it was going to be. Uh, no one living in Epcot could own land. Uh, there would be no municipal elections or government. Uh, the plan was an ever-evolving city and way of life, meaning your appliances or the structure of your home could change at any moment or on any whim. Uh, in terms of employment, everyone would have a job, thereby eliminating homelessness, in theory. Uh, you would work in the park or the hotel or the airport, uh, very much like a commune. Uh, or a cult, or work camp. Uh, Disney himself said it would be a company town. Uh, now, Disney would die before this vision was realized. He passed away in 1966, but his dream would live on, first in Tomorrowland, a model of the city appears as part of the People Mover Tour, and later in the theme park Epcot. As originally planned, Epcot was part of Disney World. It was the second park built after the Magic Kingdom uh, in 1982, but unlike Walt had hoped, people didn't live there. Instead, it realized another one of his dreams, a permanent world's fair, with a centerpiece Spaceship Earth. Uh, the Epcot of reality still seeks to showcase the future, and of all Disney parks, it's probably the most educational. The last thing we're going to be looking at comes from the same year as Epcot opened, 1982. Uh, this is Fun with Mr. Future. Uh, it was produced by Tad Stones, who would go on to work on many shows in the Disney afternoon, and was originally going to be exhibited at Epcot. In it, a de-skinned Abraham Lincoln animatronic shows us the lifestyles of the future. Uh, this short is very sarcastic in tone. It starts by mocking the developments of yesterday, which everything else we've looked at has celebrated. Uh, our host, Mr. Future, also doesn't have the highest opinion of humanity. It's very much speaking down to us, and the future, it shows us, is one of sedated misery. Computers are portrayed as the great liberator, freeing worker from boss, uh, women work, men work from home. Uh, there is a line asking, why go to work when you can stay home? I think many of us can identify with that right now. Uh, computers are also shown as an educational tool, as well as creative machines. It predicts 3D printing, and that the next innovation in television will be holography, uh, with the child being sucked in to I don't really know where, due to the parents' negligence. Uh, they appear tired and likely very depressed. While this short predicted a miserable future, Disney's were generally optimistic visions of tomorrow, and all are infinitely better than what we ended up with. Now this was not meant to be an exhaustive list, and if I miss something, feel free to mention it down below. I will also be looking deeper into this topic on Patreon, $5 a month gets you access to that and dozens of other exclusive videos, so please consider supporting us. 
Also, if you're new here, please subscribe and check out some of our other videos in the series, like Tex Avery's Tunes of Tomorrow, or our recent look at how anime predicted the future. As always, thank you so much for your interest in this channel. It means a lot to me in these trying times. Stay safe, everyone.